one of the world's premier conferences on geoeconomics and geopolitics. It addresses the most challenging issues facing the Indo-Pacific and the global order. After the successful first Australian Rosina in Sydney last year, we're back, buoyed and delighted to be hosting an even bigger event here in the nation's capital. Thanks, of course, to the enthusiastic support of the indefatigable Samir Saran and his ORF team. Once again, we are honoured to be joined by Dr Jai Shankar, who will help us open this year's dialogue. I also thank India's Ministry of External Affairs and Australia's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade for their support. And my thanks and acknowledgement to Google Australia for its support. Uh, I uh, recognise that Google was, of course, with us last year for the inaugural Rosina in Australia. And we're delighted that this year's dialogue builds on the first with an expanded agenda that reflects the growing nature of the Australia-India relationship. This really is a partnership for the future. The agenda, to borrow from Foreign Minister Wong's words, sees the world as it is, but seeks to shape it for the better. Not just for Australia and India, but because it's in the interests of the broader Indo-Pacific. We know that the Indo-Pacific is a dynamic region with enormous appetite for growth, cooperation and partnerships. And part of that regional dynamism is a diversity that brings together developed and developing economies, advanced industrial and technology-based economies, and non-industrial economies. This means there's no one-size-fits-all approach to the challenges and opportunities we face, from climate and cyber threats to capacity building and connectivity. Rosina Down Under looks beyond the Australia-India partnership to provide a pragmatic dialogue convened to discuss the practical issues confronting the entire region. We'll explore climate action, infrastructure development and critical minerals and technologies, doing so in each case with a persistent focus on collective security and prosperity. We'll hear from senior ministers, including, of course, External Affairs Minister Jai Shankar shortly, and Australia's Climate Change and Energy Minister Chris Bowen tonight, along with Japan's Vice Minister for Foreign Affairs, Masahiro Kimura. Tomorrow, we'll hear from a, a range of foreign ministers, uh, Australia's Foreign Minister Penny Wong and New Zealand's Deputy Prime Minister and Foreign Minister Winston Peters. We'll also hear from our Resources Minister, Madeleine King, on critical minerals, and from Senator Salming Birmingham, the Shadow Foreign Minister. And that's just the politicians. We'll also have senior industry figures, intelligence officials, including the ONI head Andrew Shearer, and of course, civil society thinkers. So it really is a packed dialogue. And with the US presidential election happening in the middle and all around the dialogue, we also have the opportunity to reflect on the next steps that are for the partnerships that define the Indo-Pacific. Let me say once more how pleased I am to be here uh, with you all. Uh, and of course, uh, with uh, my friend and friend of Australia, Samir Saran. Uh, and I very much look forward to a thought provoking dialogue. Uh, and I'm sure you'd all be looking forward to hearing from Samir quickly before we uh, formally open the dialogue. Thanks very much. Thank you, Justin, and thank you for uh, welcoming us to Australia once again for Ricina Down Under. I was telling my colleagues in Delhi that when you when you hosted this for the first time, this was a passion project. But when you do it for the second time, it's a commitment. And I think Ricina Down Under, the second time around, is a commitment of uh, ORF, of the Ricina platform, to create a dialogue for the Indo-Pacific, which sees voices, issues, and outcomes that serve communities, people, and of course, governments uh, that are seeking to navigate interesting times. I just want to make three points. The first, that this room is full of those who have changed the India-Australia relationship over the last 10 years. I can see so many of them, and I don't want to list them, but literally, each one of you in this room has somehow changed that bilateral, and of course, uh, uh, one of the principal architects of that change will be with us on the stage, Dr. S. J. Shankar, let me acknowledge him, he's joined us in the room at this stage. But each one of you in some ways has changed that relationship, and I think it has just begun. The next decade offers us bountiful opportunities, and we will have to put our collective minds together 
to find ways of catalyzing and in fact, uh, in many ways, capitalizing on what we have achieved over the past decade. So that's the first thought, that all of you who have worked so hard to make this relationship happen have another decade of hard work ahead of you. And I think that's the first point. Rysina platform seeks to bring all of you together in some ways to contribute to that. The second, times have changed. When we started changing our relationship, the world was very different. At this stage, it's a, it's a, it's a new world out there. Of course, we are all looking forward to the election results tomorrow, but irrespective of uh, who is elected in Washington, D.C., the message coming out of most capitals today is quite clear, that it's a do-it-yourself world. We will have to build smart coalitions, smart plurilateral groups, smart collectives, fit for purpose, agile, nimble, responsive, and purpose-driven. Communities of purpose will have to, in many ways, fill the void that effective multilateralism has left behind in its demise in some ways. So that's the second question, that we need to build communities of purpose and we need to bring voices from across the region. This is not about India, it's not about Australia, it's about communities that, that, that depend on, on stability, prosperity and predictability in that region that must participate in setting the agenda and the conversations that follow. And we in the second edition have done precisely that. From Tonga to Honolulu, from Fiji to Bhutan, we have voices of those who have stake in the future of this region sitting and, and, and telling us how they believe the world must look like in, in years from now. And I think that's the second message. Let's build communities. Let's look beyond our nose. The third, let's be happy. You're all looking sad here. This is, this is a celebration. I think this is not a somber occasion. This is an occasion to celebrate uh, uh, two very proud democracies beating some very other proud nations and discussing real issues uh, uh, through real conversations. So I want all of you to be provocative in your interventions, question them when they speak on the stage, no free lunches, uh, please, be, please be tough on the speakers, uh, other than the last panel where I'm speaking, but, uh, uh, but, but please do participate, uh, and we want it to be a dialogue and not necessarily a unidirectional conversation. So I look forward to hearing from each one of you over the next uh, 16 hours or 18 hours that we are together. And thank you so much for joining us. Now, without further ado, let me uh, introduce uh, the headline session that opens up Raisina Down Under 2.0 uh, in conversation with Dr. S. Jashankar. Dr. Jashankar requires no introduction, but uh, uh, for those who are new and those who are watching us online, uh, not only is he uh, uh, one of uh, the most eminent and foremost uh, foreign ministers in the world today. He's also a career diplomat who has served extensively uh, in, the, in, in his ministry as a practitioner and has uh, held various positions and posts. Um, Dr. Jay Shankar obviously also uh, is, is something else and I'm gonna give you a, a private tidbit. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I look forward to having that conversation with him tomorrow. He's also a cricket fan. He loves the cricket uh, game and the Aust New Zealanders have given us a thrashing. And he's going to be on stage tomorrow. I think that's a good conversation to have, sir. But he's a cricket fan as well. But most importantly, I think he has in some ways taken foreign policy to the masses and to the streets in India. In India today, you have young people people from all sections of society and, 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 and different regions participate in foreign policy. Indian foreign policy is more plural and more engaging than ever before. So he's going to speak to us today the, and, and to, to have that conversation with him, let me introduce my colleague, Justin Basi, the head of ASPI, who's been the driving force behind this dialogue, someone who served in government and now serves all of us outside of government. So Justin, let me hand it to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Samir, uh, for that. Uh, Dr. Jashanka, thank you for uh, uh, being back here in Australia uh, and for uh, uh, re-enlivening uh, the Rosina Dialogue Down Under, as Samir said, for, uh, for 2.0. Uh, and uh, to, your, uh, to your credit and to um, the team's credit, uh, you are absolutely uh, living up to the Rosina uh, being a dialogue uh, and uh, being involved in an in-conversation uh, allowing us to canvas a full range uh, of issues. So uh, uh, welcome. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure uh, for us to be able to share this time with you. Thank you. It's good to be back. Great. Um, it's, uh, uh, I would love to spend the entire time talking 
uh, uh, cricket with you, but the substantive issues uh, really, I think, um, uh, are in incredibly important, um, uh, co covering a full range of issues. Uh, I'd love to uh, have some time uh, towards the end uh, opening up to uh, some audience questions. Uh, so if you have a few, uh, think of a few uh, um, uh, very important questions uh, and we'll try and cover <coughs> as many as possible. Um, but starting, uh, Dr. Daishenka, uh, with the Australia-India bilateral uh, relationship, uh, both uh, initially as Foreign Secretary uh, and now, of course, uh, as Foreign Minister, you have helped drive a remarkable strengthening of the bilateral relationship with greater collaboration across a wider range of issues than we have ever had before. So what is it about Australia? That means India has been keen to deepen that cooperation uh, across uh, uh, multiple issues uh, from uh, the, uh, the, the diplomatic to the defence uh, areas. Um, well, uh, first of all, Justin, uh, thank you for not starting with cricket. Uh, it would have been a little painful, uh, but so let's talk about something a little more positive as the first question, which is Australia. Uh, till the cricket happens, then, <laughs> then we'll have a different conversation. Um, uh, look, uh, you know, uh, some time ago, uh, I started actually reflecting on why the Quad has worked the way it has. And my thesis, which is part of a book, uh, was, uh, yes, there's the obvious explanations, you know, changing geopolitics, uh, global goods deficit, etc. But an important part of the explanation is actually that uh, India's different bilateral relationships with Quad members have grown very substantially in this period. Uh, now, the other three Quad members have a different history and a different closer relationship. Uh, and uh, the change, in a way, I would say from 2007, when Quad was first attempted, to 2017, when the Quad was more successfully done the second time, is actually the change in the bilaterals. Uh, and I would say probably the bilateral which has changed the most is Australia. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, one metric of uh, how a relationship is really uh, is, uh, okay, so how often did the PMs meet? And I think we had, what, about a 30-year spell where our PMs never actually formally sat down. Compare that to today when we uh, have agreed on the practice of an annual summit uh, and uh, I, I look, uh, you know, at my own predecessors. I mean, this is my fifth visit to Australia in the last three years. Uh, I suspect if I looked at the last five visits of foreign ministers, probably take many, you know, probably double-digit years. Uh, and if you go beyond that, you look at uh, the quality of our defense cooperation today, uh, the, the fact that we've been able to do the first phase of a free trade uh, agreement. Uh, the fact that Australian universities were the first universities to come and say, okay, we are prepared to explore a new Indian policy regarding uh, foreign educational uh, presence. Uh, I, I look at the Indian diaspora numbers. Uh, so I, I, I look at the trade volume, uh, which is, I think, $48 billion right now. Uh, so. Uh, it, was, it was a relationship whose potential to me was waiting to be realized. It needed an effort on, a, you know, somebody had to bell the cats. Uh, and it so happened in 2014 that there was a juxtaposition of circumstances that happened. And I must say this to the credit of everybody thereafter, you know, people have, have built on it uh, layer by layer. Uh, and uh, uh, when, when I see uh, I mean, every conversation I have, we actually come up with something new to do. I mean, even on this visit, and I'm not yet done with my conversations in this town. Uh, I was in Brisbane uh, two days ago, uh, and I visited the uh, HADR warehouse uh, that uh, DFAT runs. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, it was a warehouse which helped us deliver uh, relief material to P Papua New Guinea. Uh, and when I look at it, you know, I mean, this, this is a platform which would be very helpful to us. Uh, we could think of, in fact, how it could be helpful to Quad as well. Uh, so 
the more we do, the more possibilities open up. Uh, I think somewhere we needed, uh, we needed to, there were some preconceptions on either side. I mean, let's be honest about it. Uh, that we had some image of you, and you probably had the same of us, which somewhere held us back. I think once we have overcome it, we are today really the relationship is on a roll. Uh, on a roll it is. Um, and uh, I think the bilateral relationship, um, uh, which has gone from strength to strength, uh, then uh, goes into um, uh, the minilaterals. You mentioned the quad. Uh, so. Let me ask you uh, something you have canvassed before. You've been asked about previously um, that India's simultaneous active engagement of groups like the Quad, uh, along with groupings like BRICS, uh, which are seemingly contradictory groupings. Uh, your response has consistently been uh, that India is able to walk and chew gum at the same time. And of course, the, the ability to understand uh, all nations and work with all parties is vital. Uh, Australia has missions uh, all over the world, including places like Moscow and Tehran, of course. So my, my impression, uh, Minister, has been that India sees value in being in all these groupings, <coughs> but doesn't always necessarily see them as equal. Uh, how, how, how do you as Foreign Minister, uh, and how does India <coughs> navigate uh, these, these different relationships to still ensure that countries around the world see India um, as uh, a large nation that prioritizes the protection of international rules? Um, you know, uh, again, uh, we, history, uh, political culture, um, to some extent, a kind of a security ethos, all these feed into uh, decisions you make. Uh, in the case of Australia, uh, I mean, you have uh, a long, uh, you know, uh, a very old treaty relationship with the United States, uh, which is your primary uh, security, I mean, it's the anchor relationship in a way. Uh, that's not been our history. Uh, our history has been really to kind of maximize space and options and gain more maneuvering ground and uh, try and do more things, uh, you know, autonomously. Uh, so that's where we are coming from. Now, uh, uh, given that uh, it's natural today uh, when actually the world is uh, much more uh, fragmented, uh, when it, in one sense clearly much more multipolar, uh, much more complicated, uh, that, you know, it's, uh, it's not... Uh, it's not uh, uh, easy to say today, okay, you know, these countries are on that side and those countries are on that side. There's a lot of cross-holdings uh, in a way. Uh, and uh, uh, given all that, uh, we do think that uh, uh, the uh, ability uh, uh, to, uh, to, in fact, not just the ability, the strategy uh, to be, uh, to have you know, a presence in different groupings and develop working combinations with different countries. Because each one of them has a logic of its own, you know. And, and I, would not, uh, I would not set uh, one uh, against the other. I mean, to us, we really honestly, and you know, I'm, I'm not being uh, clever here in my argument, we honestly don't think being members of BRICS uh, excludes you from being members of Quad, because to us they serve very different uh, purposes. I mean, Quad has a certain Indo-Pacific context. Uh, again, the manner in which it grew, the, uh, the building blocks of Quad uh, were very different. Uh, in the case of BRICS, uh, it was really a coming together of uh, some large countries who, whose common uh, feature in many ways was that they were non-Western. Uh, so by joining Quad, now I don't become Western. I mean, I still remain non-Western. I'm not anti-Western, but I'm not Western. So, uh, so I, I think, uh, uh, in fact, uh, in many ways, I would argue that this uh, uh, multiplicity of memberships uh, and being able to navigate them uh, uh, are, are natural. I would even go a step further and say, uh, actually, there's a service we can do by this, you know, at a, at a time when 
you know, the world is very polarized and countries often don't communicate with each other. Uh, uh, I, I look at the world today uh, and let's take the two big conflicts which are underway, Ukraine and uh, the Middle East. There are not too many countries and too many leaders who can go to Moscow and go to Kiev and go to Tehran and go to, uh, to Tel Aviv. Uh, so, uh, yeah. No, there, there aren't, uh, that's, that's for sure. Uh, and I think that the, uh, the, the world uh, does uh, look to you, uh, look to India in, in many ways to, uh, uh, to play uh, a, uh, a balancing <coughs> role in many of these, uh, these areas. Uh, and perhaps uh, from, from Australia's perspective to keep an eye on uh, um, some other, other countries as well. Uh, can, I, can I raise um, uh, the, the, the recent BRICS uh, and um, some of the language in uh, the Kazan Declaration uh, that um, int interests me and I think it interests many people uh, in Australia and the region uh, that goes to show, I suppose, how challenging you talk about it being fragmented and complicated, the world, how, how challenging it is um, to manage all these groups. The, the, the language in the declaration um, indicated that the sanctions, for example, against Russia um, for its invasion of Ukraine were unlawful, coercive uh, measures. And it also described Israel's pager operation against um, Hezbollah as a premeditated terrorist act. So is that, just, is that part of the navigation that India needs to go through to make sure that it is part of these groups uh, and, and can play um, the important role that the large nation India is? Or uh, is it becoming more difficult uh, when perhaps uh, I suppose, in my view, some of those BRICS countries are imposing on others in a way that maybe the Quad Democratic countries aren't imposing in, in their field. Well, you know, negotiations are negotiations. You know, whether uh, it's once you are inside a room, everybody tries to get their point of view reflected uh, to the best. Uh, so it's not like one particular group has very heated negotiations and the other ones uh, giving all members a free pass. It doesn't happen that way. Uh, what really, you know, the reality of uh, uh, my job is uh, in each, each of these groupings and any other uh, grouping you go to, uh, you enter the room with some uh, key objectives. You know others do the same. Uh, often... They could be, uh, uh, they could differ, uh, sometimes in nuance or emphasis, sometimes much more fundamentally. Uh, and then um, you try at the end of an outcome document to, uh, to get the best you can. So I don't, you know, if you look at any gathering and you ask uh, a country, saying, did you, get, you know, is this the perfect document? Did it reflect everything you, which is your national position? I think anybody truthful will say, no, it did not. Because every, every gathering, every outcome document is some kind of compromise to some degree. So often, therefore, when you, uh, you know, present me with this kind of situation, I would say, yeah, well, you know, that was our position in the BRICS. That, does not mean it would necessarily be our position somewhere else. I mean, life is a degree of maneuverability and uh, adaptation and some give and take and uh, uh, some wheeling and dealing. Yeah, no, it makes sense. So, so uh, standing by principles but adapting to That's the right. particular audience, uh, that makes sense. Uh, the, uh, you, you refer, Minister, to the importance of negotiations. Um, I, I think a lot of countries, including Australia, uh, look to your relationship with China mm -hmm. um, uh, that, uh, and the negotiations across a range of issues that, uh, that India is, has dealt with. And, of course, recently the two countries announced a way forward on issues concerning the, uh, the disputed border, border area. Uh, that does seem to validate um, the, the idea of negotiation uh, and uh, give and take and that, dipl that diplomacy remains vital uh, in resolving these disputes. Um, we, of course, have been there before uh, when it comes to uh, China and uh, making agreements and then breaking agreements. Uh, so I, I'm keen to hear your thoughts on where you see the India-China uh, relationship, uh, having now made that seeming breakthrough. Where do you see that relationship uh, going in the next few years, given that it's not just 
important for India and China, but the, the relationship is really vital for the region itself. Sure. Uh, well, uh, uh, Justin, let me split that into three parts. What did we just negotiate? What still lies ahead of us? Uh, and uh, uh, in a sense, what's our uh, medium, long-term view of uh, the particular relationship? What we negotiated just now, uh, on October 21st, was the last set of what we call disengagement agreements, uh, which essentially means that after the summer of 2020, uh, Chinese and Indian troops uh, have been deployed, have been forward deployed, you can say, uh, along the line of actual control uh, in uh, distances which were extremely concerning. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the priority has been to find ways of uh, separating the troops, which is why the word disengagement, uh, having them go back to their normal you know, operating basis as far as possible, uh, and also resuming patrol uh, in the way in which it used to be done uh, in 2020. Now, uh, this lot of, uh, the, the last set of, the last agreement, you can say, uh, primarily related to uh, two areas uh, uh, which had to do with patrolling, uh, where there were obstructions to the patrolling and those obstructions uh, were resolved. Uh, and the expectation is that patrolling there would resume. In fact, it is happening as we speak. It'll take a little while because it's... it's uh, so we did the initial verification patrolling, then the actual patrolling takes place uh, after that. Now, that's the part which we have got done. So you can say, in a way, the disengagement uh, chapter is done. Its implementation will happen in the coming days to everybody's satisfaction. Uh, and the part which now awaits us, the immediate part which awaits us, is what we call the de-escalation, which is the build-up of forces along the line of actual control, because both of us, uh, in our case, it was a counter-deployment. In their case, it was the initial deployment. Uh, we have many more forces with much greater uh, weaponry than existed along the line or proximate to the line uh, before 2020. So we have negotiations ahead of us. Uh, during this period, our relationship was also very profoundly affected because uh, it has always been an uh, assumption on our side that peace and tranquility in the border areas is a prerequisite for the development of our ties. And since peace and tranquility was disturbed, including uh, one major incident of bloodshed, uh, uh, we, you know, our relationship with China has cut back in different ways. Uh, so we also have to look at it. Now, everything is not going to happen at once. I mean, there will obviously be discussions of various kinds. But at the meeting, uh, with the, the formal bilateral meeting between Prime Minister Modi and President Xi, which was actually happening after five years, uh, what was agreed was that the foreign minister and the uh, national security advisor, we would meet our counterpart, uh, and uh, so would you know, the relevant officials, and find ways by which we will have to discuss you know, how do we normalize the relationship uh, and you know, what would be the extent and the pace and the manner in which we would do that. Uh, the third part is, okay, but how do we actually see that relationship? Uh, you know, it's, it's really, in a way, um, quite a challenge because you have two, you know, in a, the two most populous countries in the world, both of whom uh, have been rising. Uh, uh, they are rising in a broadly parallel time frame, uh, physically next to each other, uh, in a manner in which I would argue there are very few historical examples. Uh, and how do you... Uh, establish an equilibrium, uh, equilibrium between yourselves at, in the border, uh, border areas, which happens to be disputed as well, uh, as well as establish a working relationship uh, uh, in, on other issues, you know, regional issues, multilateral issues, uh, 
uh, how does how do your new expressions of uh, influence and activities impact on the relationship you know where do they uh, in a way uh, uh, come into contact with each other. I think these are really a very complex set of issues and uh, uh, do require a lot of uh, thinking and uh, management. I think uh, a lot of the uh, regional countries can, can learn from what you're doing and you mentioned equilibrium. It's, it's definitely a word that Australia's foreign minister uses uh, a lot as well. I, I'm, I'm keen to uh, um, uh, give the... the uh, the audience out here a chance to, to ask you a, a couple of questions uh, as, as well. Uh, I think we've got some uh, some roving uh, mics. If you uh, if you see the roving mics and want to uh, gesture towards them, please please do so. There's a hand over here. Thank you so much, uh, Minister. My name is Lan Anh, come from Diplomatic Academy of Vietnam. I have um, two questions for you. Um, the first question is that um, uh, I know that you are the uh, author of the book, uh, Indian Way. So I just would like to explore um, in your op opinion, what is um, the Indian way um, or what is the Indian strategic priority in the face of uh, more and more uh, stronger and stronger collaboration between China and Russia? That is my, my first question. And if I may, um, I do have the second questions. Um, my second question is that, um, in your opinion, how China, um, how India and the, and, and the global South um, will, will, will do in um, the high tech and the criti critical tech competitions um, between the US and China and between the other power um, in which um, in which way that they can reduce the over dependence and increase autonomies thank you um, well actually you had three because you had <laughs> India way you had Russia China you had I said uh, so uh, look the reason I wrote uh, the first book was I was uh, <coughs> I just ended uh, 41 years in the Foreign Service. Uh, I felt I'd learned something in that period uh, and uh, felt this great urge to express that something uh, in prose. Uh, and um, uh, part of it was also a few things which provoked me. Uh, you know, um, there was this, this big debate uh, exactly is there an Indian strategic uh, school of thinking? Uh, and uh, uh, the, the, our own internal debate in India saying how much are we learning from our own history, our tradition, our experiences. So the idea was uh, to draw on our analogies, on our history, on our epics, uh, and uh, create a, a kind of a framework which would then uh, be popularized into uh, others sort of thinking along similar lines. So that, that frankly was, was the uh, endeavor. Uh, the Russia-China issue, uh, look, uh, if, if one uh, looks at the continental land mass, uh, I mean, but I, please do not take it in uh, any other way than I mean it, there are three big there are three big countries, uh, not to South, Russia, China, India. There are other countries, some of them big as well, uh, but these are the three largest countries. Now, it's been uh, almost, I would say, a kind of a strategy one on 101 for us, that if there are three, of, three big players who are proximate to each other, uh, it's in our interest to make sure uh, that remembering the uh, basic uh, geometry we learnt in elementary school, the two sides of a triangle will be bigger than the third. Never allow two sides to come to a point where the third is utterly disadvantaged. Uh, so this is not something which has happened now. Uh, it's been really for us almost like uh, one of the first principles of our foreign policy or our national strategy in a way. Uh, and it remains a concern. Uh, and uh, I would even argue going beyond that, 
uh, at a time when Russia's uh, options, uh, Russia's relationship with the West uh, is very badly damaged, uh, and Russia is turning more and more towards Asia. Uh, it's useful uh, in Asia uh, that we give Russia more options. So that would be an advice I offer to Vietnam as well. Uh, so I think uh, the more um, sort of broadly Russia is engaged by Asian countries, uh, frankly, uh, that will allow that much more diplomatic uh, political flexibility uh, for everybody concerned. This is not to say that it's not directed against any particular country. I think this is the way the world should be run. In our view, everybody should get more space, more options, more, more solutions. Uh, and it makes for a, a more, um, you know, uh, let us say, a more exciting uh, life. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's what we all want. Uh, your, your third qu question on ISET. Uh, uh, you, you know, there are, there are issues where sometimes being close to the middle and focusing on expanding your state, uh, space is a, a primary objective. Uh, there are issues on which uh, doing collaborations are your primary objective. Uh, at that stage, this is not one of those issues you look for balancing so much. You actually look for practical outcomes. You look at a, a choice of partners and say, which choice of partners is likely to be more advantageous to me? Uh, uh, certainly from an Indian perspective, I would say uh, for us, uh, you know, uh, by and large, uh, the Western world, specifically the Quad, even more specifically the United States, uh, is uh, a very crucial uh, ISET partner. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's really the direction you should be looking at where we are concerned. Thank you. And I think because that was three questions, we might have a chance for maybe uh, one more before uh, uh, moving on to our uh, to uh, Minister Bowen's session. Um, with the Indian community being the quickest uh, growing community in Australia, um, with such a large di diaspora, as a foreign minister, what would you suggest that the Australian community can do to encourage the diaspora here, but also the relationship uh, with India? Uh, discuss more cricket. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, look, uh, seriously, uh, if I look at the big diaspora uh, societies, uh, and, and again, you know, um, there are different kinds here. Some are more temporary, some are very narrowly work-focused, some are with families, some are without families. But uh, the, the, the kind of diaspora I see growing in Australia, uh, I, I honestly think uh, that it holds the key to the future of our ties. It's not the only key, but it's a very important key because the, uh, the model, in a way, the unconscious model uh, which is shaping my thoughts is really the manner in which our relationship with the U.S. transformed. You know, I, I don't think it's a coincidence uh, that um, the change, the uh, change in India-U.S. relations can be almost completely correlated with the growth of the diaspora in the United States. So, uh, uh, there's an obvious lesson there. What can the uh, Australian society do in a way? Uh, well, it can obviously, I, I think, make the best use of the diaspora, make them more comfortable, uh, encourage them to maintain their uh, identity and to serve as a living bridge. Uh, and I would say uh, if the, you know, uh, uh, where India is concerned, the diaspora is usually very comfortable with the home country. Uh, and, and some of it is in the nature of the diaspora. You know, people leave for non-political reasons. Uh, they tend to be family-centric. They tend to maintain family bonds back home. Uh, so there's a lot of travel uh, and, and contacts in a way between the diaspora and the country of origin. So, I would say the more the diaspora is made comfortable, the more they are seen as equal partners in Australia, uh, 
the more they are likely to serve actually as a as a almost as the ballast of the of the growing uh, relationship uh, thank you uh, and uh, you have been uh, very kind with your uh, time uh, i haven't uh, left enough uh, time for questions but uh, the the good news is you are back with us uh, tomorrow uh, okay. with a uh, with a session with your counterparts uh, ministers wong and and peters uh, so there will be uh, uh, more opportunities, uh, but I, uh, I can't uh, let you go without uh, saying that obviously uh, the dialogue is uh, happening in the middle of the US election, or the US election is happening in the middle of uh, dialogue. Um, uh, who, uh, who do you think is going to win? The future President of the United States. <laughs> Good, uh, and you'll uh, work with uh, whoever that may be. Right. Uh, great. Well, uh, Minister Jashenka, uh, thank you for opening uh, the Resilient Dialogue in dialogue. Uh, you can we're willing to canvas a whole range of issues, uh, and I hope the rest of your trip uh, is a successful one. Thanks very thank much. Thank you. Thank you, Justin.